tales for dark nights. The Curious Case of Lolo Marino. Written by Jeffrey E. Bright. Performed by Steve Taylor. Featuring Spike Edmund, Jesse Cornett, Jeff Clement, David Cummings, and Otis Gyrie. Production by Jesse Cornett. Original score by Brandon Boone. My name is Detective Matthew Prasa. I've been a cop for close to three decades. For the last few years, I've worked in the 8th Precinct Homicide Division. A staff of around 250,000 people can't compete with the murder rate of New York City, but we see our fair share of cases. To be honest, homicides are usually easy to solve. You don't have to look too far to find a killer because most victims meet their maker at the hands of someone they know. It is a rare circumstance when a murder is perpetrated by a complete stranger. I pride myself that every case I've worked resulted in a conviction. I've been batting a thousand my entire career. I was, however, about to open a case that was beyond the typical run-of-the-mill fare. I received a call from dispatch before I had even left my house. Well, house might be a generous term for the shitty little brick two-bedroom ranch I was forced to live in after the divorce. At least the rent was affordable. Anyway, the call came in that a body had been found in an alley next to Callahan's place off Robinson Avenue. Since dead bodies normally don't go anywhere until the meat wagon comes calling, I stopped off for a morning coffee and made the crime scene 15 minutes later. What's the call, Dell? I asked the patrolman on scene as I slipped under the yellow tape. He's still dead. He shrugged. Nice great, detective. Get bent, Dell. I stroked my newly grown mustache beard combo. You wish you had it so good. Immediately, I noticed that there were no evidence markers littering the alleyway, only a crushed, bloody, corrugated refrigerator box. No discarded weapons, no shell casings. Whatever the killer used, he packed it out when he fled the scene. Jimmy, I got the attention of the CSI photographer. Are we good to go? Yeah, we're, uh, done here. He was distracted, looking at the digital pictures he had just taken. Never seen anything like it. Like what? Well, this bum got turned into street pizza. Somebody ran him down while he was sleeping in that cardboard box. Probably never saw it coming. You've seen Roadkill before. What makes this different? Somebody rolled over this guy multiple times. Definite 480. Jimmy called it. Definitely a code 480. Felony. Hit and run. The tread marks showed obvious signs of multiple passes. Somebody really wanted this guy dead. I pulled out my trusty pen and lifted up the edge of the cardboard. Stench of unwashed hobo hit me head on. Dell, get some gloves and give me a hand, would you? Sure, Detective. Officer Dell slipped on a pair of latex gloves. I had him hold up the top of the homeless man's cardboard condo. You've never seen the effect of a one-ton vehicle landing atop a human? I wouldn't recommend it before dinner. His head was a popped basketball filled with canned cranberry sauce, unrecognizable. 
The rib cage was most likely touching his spine by the ruptured organs spilling from the chest cavity. Clean bone broken in several places protruded from his limbs. From my initial observation, Jimmy was wrong about one thing. This poor bastard knew what was happening when he died. I carefully picked through his clothing and was rewarded with an expired driver's license that he had tucked in his coat pocket. Holy shit. What is it, Detective? I know this guy. The victim's name was Reginald Ingaloob. Reggie was a cop, but he had been kicked off the force over a decade ago. I spent a little time with him on the vice squad before I transferred the homicide. I wouldn't say he was a dirty cop, but he was lazy and sloppy. The story I got was that Reggie lost a kilo of blow and a couple thousand dollars from a big bust. Since nobody could prove the allegations, he was put on administrative leave, where he proceeded to solicit sex for drugs from a high school girl. Temporary leave became a permanent vacation, and would have ended in an extended stay at the Grey Bar Hilton had it not been for the police chief wanting to avoid a serious media black eye. Now, Reggie Engelub ended his inglorious life as a splatter in an alley that reeked of rotting food and car exhaust. Whatever sins he committed in the past, he didn't deserve a death like this. Nobody does. Hey, have the text cross-check his prints with the PD personnel database first. I passed the bag driver's license to Dell. I got a feeling it'll save some time. Sure thing, Detective. Contrary to all the TV shows about detectives, there wasn't much to do once the M.E. picked up the body. The homeless shelters I canvassed vaguely remembered him. He mostly kept to himself, drank a bit, never stayed longer than a night or two when the weather got bad. Although some of his fellow street urchins admitted seeing Reggie the day of his murder, they didn't know much about that night. Before he hit the streets, Reggie was a dedicated bachelor, so there was no family to interview. If there were no family or friends to speak of, who did it? It wasn't likely to have been another homeless person because bums rarely owned cars. Besides, the tire marks were from a car with good tread, so who would want to repeatedly run over a disgraced ex-cop? After an eventful day of questions and no answers, I hung it up and headed home. Of course, I kept thinking about Reggie. As I drove, I tried to think of whether a former buddy in the department might have had a grievance with Reggie. Nah, that was as much a dead end as the cul-de-sac where I now live. Seriously, what cop would wait a decade for revenge? Cops by nature are not very patient people. Sad but true. I tried to distract myself counting all the for sale yard signs that covered my street like wild dandelions. Talk about suburban blight. I came home only to be greeted by a cold house. Not emotionally cold, temperature cold. Every older home has its quirks, and this house definitely had its share. The pilot for the gas furnace had gone out again. That meant I had to restart the pilot on the ancient water heater, too. I guess I'm lucky I didn't have to venture into some spider-infested basement. The house is built like every typical 40s-style ranch. One floor, no basement or attic. All I had to do was open the service closet in the kitchen and spark the pilot lights on the rusting equipment. Even though I stopped smoking a year ago, I was glad I kept a few spare lighters for such an occasion. Maintenance done, I poured myself a glass of bourbon and sipped on it while the drone of Sports Center lulled me to sleep. Still, I couldn't prevent murder scenarios from bouncing around my dreams. Cold showers suck. I let loose a string of obscenities and headed back to the service closet. From the morning sun peering through the kitchen window, I could see that the pilot light had not gone out on the water heater. Somehow the temperature knob had been turned all the way down. I cranked the dial into the red, but I knew it would take hours for the damn thing to get cooking. 
So I braved the icy waters of my shower and got ready for another work day. No sooner did I walk through the door than Captain Deacons magically appeared next to my desk with a file folder. Hey, we get anything back on the bum murder? Yeah. I held up the coroner's preliminary report. It was Reggie and Galoob. Vehicular homicide. Lab techs are researching the tire treads we found on the scene. Should have something back today. Good. Deacons dropped the file on my desk. You remember Jace Vark? Yeah. I ran a couple of undercover stints with him a lifetime ago. Why? I need you to go out to Sunnyvale Trailer Park. You need a ride somewhere, Captain? I knew that was where Jace retired a couple of years back. The captain shook his head. Nah, the coroner's taking care of that. I need you on the scene. I jumped in my car and headed to the outskirts of town where the trailer park sat. The whole drive out, I thought about Sergeant Jason Jace Vark, retired. He was a pretty jovial guy, who made up for his limited brain power with elbow grease. He was built like an oak, with a crew cut. Good guy. Street smart. Dead. I pulled up to the smoldering remains of Vark's trailer. Pieces of double-wide aluminum siding were scattered in a wide berth. Fire Chief Kelly and his crew were already sifting through the burnt rubble for clues. What do you say, Chet? Hey, Matt. Chet Kelly tipped his helmet back. There was a fire. Good one. Yeah, I see that. Any guess how it started? Ah. Uh-huh. Kelly looked at me with a deadpan expression. Care to share? This was the regular routine in the police firefighter relationship. Antagonizing each other was in our DNA. Well, he began in his usual cops are idiots tone. What we have here is a complete burn. That means it took less than an hour before that trailer it was completely engulfed. Under normal conditions, a trailer like this could go up that quickly, but it's unlikely. He offered me a piece of wood to sniff. Smell that. I nodded. Accelerant. Gasoline? Nope. Do you feel a little tickle in your throat? It's not a reaction to the burnt wood. It's your airway reacting to the accelerant, which in this case happens to be turpentine. And as we know, turpentine is resin made from pine trees. A petroleum-based accelerant like gasoline... Well, it has to rely on its surroundings or it evaporates quickly. Turpentine, on the other hand, also burns hot and fast, but the resin base allows it to burn longer. Fascinating. So we're looking at arson. What's with the dispersal pattern? Wait, you had a propane stove, right? We might make a decent investigator out of you yet. Chief Kelly slapped me on the back. Must have been full. When it hit that tank, boom. He illustrated by making a mushroom cloud with his stubby hands. Trailer blown down. <laughs> he added a laugh. Thanks, Chet, but uh, I think I'll stick to police work and let you guys play in the dirt. I spent the rest of my time on scene interviewing the inhabitants of Sunnyvale. The balding park manager and his shirtless lackey were of no help. Neither were the stoned and drunk residents that littered the various single and double wide homes. Clearly, nobody was talking. Another dead end for a former brother in blue. Back at the station, I milled over the evidence in a large black coffee. I swear, the only time I get headaches is on cases like these. I popped a couple of aspirin, chased them with warm caffeine. I set the case files for Reggie and Jace in my N-file box, reclined in my chair, and closed my eyes for better focus. Detective Parasa? My eyes popped open to Officer Dell standing by my desk with a file in hand. What you got, Dell? The medical examiner? 
thought you should see this. He held out the file, but took the file with a sour look. How about you tell me what it says so I don't have to hunt for my reading glasses? I know you peeped. The coroner's found a correlation between the two victims, Engelib and Vark. What did he find? Dell smiled knowingly. It's not what he found. It's what he didn't find. Cryptic much? Officer spilled the beans like a kid describing his new Christmas toys to friends. The vehicular assault and the fire were the official cause of death. But their hearts were removed. Dell paused and leaned toward me. And they're missing pieces. Like someone took a bite out of them. No shit, I said. More as a statement than a question. I wouldn't kid you, Detective. He sounded seriously sincere. The coroner is making bite mark impressions. Thanks, kid. Make sure the captain sees this. Will do, Detective. Sudden inspiration smacked me in the face like my morning shower. Do me a favor. Pull the parole sheets for the past two weeks. Skip the county stuff. And get me the reports from Western Correctional. Right away. Dell bounded away like Robin Hood had just invited him to be one of his merry men. The new information gnawed at the back of my brain. I felt like somebody was asking me a trivia question about a TV show I used to watch when I was young, but I just couldn't quite call up the answer. Concentrating only pushed the answer farther from my mental grasp. I knew that I knew there was a connection, but damned if I could put a bow on it. The parole sheets cleared all my cobwebs. Before I moved to the Homicide Division, I made my detective bones as part of an operation in the Vice Squad. Back in the day, a violent Colombian gang called the Viento Duro made my city part of a cocaine cartel pipeline. We estimated these scumbags were using our city as a base of operations to distribute the drugs to multiple destinations in the Midwest. We're talking about an operation that pumped millions of dollars in poison across five states. Essentially, they were the head of the drug-dealing octopus, and we were determined to make calamari. But it wasn't going to be easy. Our biggest problem was the fear factor these Colombians instilled in everyone, including members of our police force. These sleazeballs would use anything to keep people in line. This included payoffs, intimidation, blackmail, torture, and murder. The lowest tactics were always on the menu. The worst of them was their leader, Mateo Lolo Marino. Lolo, an abbreviation of his gang nickname, Loco Lobo. He stood six foot two, weighed about 285. He was physically imposing, but it was the darkness behind those brown eyes that could unnerve even the bravest man. Marino was known to lead the torture sessions because he enjoyed it. <laughs> Pain in the eyes of his victims was his drug. When the bodies began to pile up, we knew he was addicted, and nothing could ever satiate his appetite, except death or jail. We formed a task force of guys who refused to be corrupted. We were hungry and idealistic, ready to rage against the dying of the light. This was our town. If we failed, Anything we had worked to achieve and everything the badge meant would be as useful as a car with square wheels. I joined Ingaloo, Vark, and a select few to set the wrongs to right. I'm not gonna lie, it took a year before we finally nailed those bastards. Well, that and some extra SWAT guys we called in to help bag them. I can't tell you how satisfying it was when the three of us took the stand as witnesses for the prosecution. Our case was ironclad and Marino could only sit at the defendant's table grinding his teeth. When the gavel fell, Marino hurled vengeful curses at us as they dragged him away to serve what we thought would be a lifetime in maximum security. The court bailiffs could barely restrain this monster of a man. Apparently, we were wrong. Five days before Ingaloo was murdered, the Ninth Circuit Court quietly overturned his conviction on grounds of evidence tampering. Marino was free on a technicality, and he wasted no time in his quest to fulfill the bloody promises he made in court a decade prior. How do I know Marino was the killer? Easy. The heart removals. Lolo told anyone who'd listen that he was descended from Aztec kings. These rulers would conquer their foes and eat the heart of the losing commander. Marino was batshit crazy enough to do the same thing to his own defeated enemies. 
Knowing I was the third stop on Lolo's heart-munching comeback tour didn't frighten me. Sure, if I still had a wife and kids to worry about, I might have started sweating, but I'm a crusty old bastard past his pension date. I was nothing but the job. No way was this psycho going to punch my ticket. I shared my discovery with Captain Deacons. He wanted to put a patrol outside the house. I declined. It was more important to have as many officers as possible on the streets. The captain didn't argue and issued the APB for Marino. He told me to check in when I got home and I agreed, just to appease him. I decided to take the long way home. There's a difference between precaution and paranoia, but I was losing the ability to tell one from the other. Many times in my career, I'd been called upon to tail a vehicle. I figured the reverse would be just as easy. When I pulled into my driveway, no headlights were in my rearview mirror. I was safe. For now. Needless to say, I didn't waste any time keying open my front door and turning the deadbolt. Remembering my dumb decision to redline my water heater... I checked to make sure everything was okay. I'd seen a Mythbusters episode where they proved a faulty water heater could be dangerous. Damn thing built up so much pressure it blew through three stories after a short buildup. I opened the service closet to make sure my heating equipment wasn't imminently poised to destroy my cramped home. Although I'm sure renter's insurance would cover any damage. Tomorrow I'd remind myself to go buy a policy. I was quickly distracted by a noise outside. It sounded like a branch scraping a pane of glass. It seemed to be coming from my living room window. I looked through the small window and caught a police cruiser looping the cul-de-sac, honking twice before it headed out to the main road. For once, I was happy the captain lied. I started to close the curtain and consider a glass of chilled bourbon. It was then I caught a weird reflection. It was no mirage that confronted me. Hola, Detective Prasa. Did you miss me? Mateo Marino stared at me through the window. Get off my lawn! I pulled my 357 revolver from the shoulder holster. He vanished from the window. I took comfort in the fact that he'd have a hard time trying to shimmy through the window anyway. A freight train slammed into the house. Again the train landed. I blessed my shitty little home for its World War II construction. Unfortunately, I couldn't say the same for my door. I could see wood dust shaking loose from the frame and I knew it wouldn't hold much longer. The hinges would give away before my deadbolt. Little pig. Little pig. Let me in. Not by the green hair of my freaking double chin, scumbag! I popped a couple of shots through the thick wood door. The half-deserted neighborhood seemed quieter than usual. Any good cop, or parent for that matter, knows silence means trouble. I slowly drew back the curtain, hoping I'd find a dead Colombian hoodlum laid out on the lawn, sporting a couple of new holes in his chest. What I saw instead was his massive hand plowed through the triple pane glass window like he was punching through tissue paper. He snagged me by the suit jacket and yelled, I will eat you whole! It was then I noticed his hand. It had no cuts or glass shards embedded in his forearm. The muscles stretched and tightened into thick cords. Lolo's skin turned a deep chocolate color. Brown hair rapidly sprouted across his arm while his fingers lengthened and grew vicious claws. In the moonlight, see he had transformed into a beast with glinting yellow cat's eyes and a sharp toothy grin. A low guttural growl huffed from his muscle rippling body. He let loose a howl that iced my soul and I finally understood why his nickname Loco Lobo translated to Crazy Wolf. With no time to waste, I took aim and fired until the hammer issued a dead click. Lolo stood there laughing, not a scratch on him. I knew I was not that bad of a shot. I flipped open the cylinder, shook out the shell casings, and reloaded. When I looked through the broken window, he was gone. More damn silence. 
Not sure if this was the calm before the storm or if I was in the eye of the hurricane, but it was time to take the offense. If this was the OK Corral, then I was going to be Wyatt fucking Earp. Hey, Lolo! I yelled at the broken window. You're even dumber than I remembered. A real criminal mastermind would have tried the back door first. I could hear movement outside. With an animalistic snore, I heard him start around the house. He had taken the bait. I ran to the service closet, dialed the hot water heater knob all the way into the red and jammed the release valve closed. Just as I dove behind the breakfast island, and unlike the front door, I knew the back door wouldn't last a couple of shots before it gave up the ghost. Pieces of the flimsy door exploded into the house with such force that some jagged splinters embedded into the drywall. In the doorway, the massive beast stood, nostrils flaring, eyes filled with the fires of hell itself. I leveled my gun and took advantage of the partial coverage the breakfast island afforded. Hold it right there, hairball! I lined them up in my gun sight. Time for dinner, he growled. How about a snack first? I drew back the hammer of my 357. Marino howled with laughter and moved slowly toward me. He offered a look of confusion when I changed targets and filed the shot into the water heater. The tank's metal skin briefly buckled before rupturing. Over 85,000 PSI of scalding water exploded across the tiny kitchen. Luckily, the concussive blast buried me under the uprooted island. The creature howled in pain, taking the full force of the boiling shockwave. Ears ringing from the blast, I quickly dug myself out. The kitchen had turned into ground zero and smelled like wet dog. In the middle of the devastation lay Mateo Lolo Marino. Most of his thick animal hair had been blasted away. His body writhed in a mass of third-degree burns as he whimpered like a puppy who had been spanked for peeing on the carpet. The big bad wolf looked on helplessly as I picked up a discarded kitchen knife and straddled him. There was no fear or remorse in his glittering yellow eyes as I raised the blade, only pain and hate. The knife had no problem piercing his seared chest. I cut a long trench under his barrel rib cage and thrust a hand into the warm cavity. The last thing Lolo saw before he died was me. Taking a big, juicy bite of his beating heart. The aftermath was, to say the least, complicated. Captain Deacons had no idea how to write it up without drawing every paranormal investigator and Bigfoot hunter in the Midwest. So we decided to pretend all the supernatural stuff never happened. We explained the damage away as a tragic accident caused by a faulty hot water heater. The home invasion, Lolo's transformation, and the details surrounding his death were never recorded. We quietly had Marino's body cremated. That pretty much tied a bow on that. And we were back to chasing real life perps. Well, not all of us. I was homeless. That little brick house was still structurally sound, but contractors estimated six to eight months to repair the extensive interior damage. I didn't let it get to me. I got flooded with invites from friends for a temporary crash pad. The best of these came from a cute little number who worked down in the records department. Officer Locks had a little place on the lake with a spare guest house. She said I was welcome to stay as long as I liked. It sounded perfect for a much-needed vacation from the grind, so I decided to take Goldie up on her generous offer. Unfortunately, she neglected to mention the bear problem she was having. That's another story. Thanks for listening. The story you've just heard in this channel are fan-funded. Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com today to become a patron and help us bring radio theater back from the dead. Just click support us. Choose an amount you're comfortable with and become a part of our family today. Just $2 per month gets you immediate access to our patrons area. There, you'll find advanced new releases, our incredible archive of over 300 hours of productions, plus never-before-heard bonus material. Best of all, it's totally ad-free and in HD MP3 format. 
you get insider updates from our production team, the secret stash of streaming downloadable HD indie films, and you get to experience our patrons only one-on-one live events, putting you up close and personal with your favorite performers, unscripted and unrehearsed. All of this and more is yours today, and all you have to do is choose your level of support. Go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com now and join us as we turn off the lights and turn on the dark.